A few weeks ago, when I was doing my daily stroll, I found this little analog TV set on the sidewalk, left for dead. And harsh as it may sound, normally I would not have taken it home with me. But this time I made an exception, because when I was about 15 years old, my parents gave me a very similar Philips TV set for my birthday. Although I must admit in a color more suited for the 70s. Back then it had been my window to the world, and now, somehow, I felt obligated to rescue this distant cousin of my orange roommate. So I took it home, cleaned it up, dried it, fed it some fresh electricity. And what do you know, it was still alive. So what now? I did not have the heart to throw it back out in the streets, especially with Christmas coming up. Also, in the short time we were together, we'd bonded quite a bit. In fact, it stole the hearts of the whole family. My daughter was ecstatic. This was so much more fun than all those daft Kiwiko boxes. And this could well have been the happy ending to this video. Still, I had a feeling that even in its new home, my little friend was not truly happy. Something was missing. It had no one to really communicate with on the same wavelength. But just by sheer accident, I met these two buddies online named Rode and Schwartz, who offered a chance to cheer it up a little bit. In case you're confused about where this is going, this video is about analog TV, a technology that has rapidly become obsolete. And I must admit, this subject is a bit outside my comfort zone. But I will also discuss color spaces and signal modulation, which are two things that personally I find very interesting. Before this video I always thought that TV was sort of radio with benefits, but it's not. It's actually on a completely different level of complexity. Okay, so let's go. So what you see here on the kitchen table is actually the full Monty of analog TV, starting out with a video signal generator that feeds a composite video signal into a transmitter. The transmitter can add various signals to the video, such as, for example, audio or data, and all of this is then transmitted as a complex electromagnetic wave using a simple antenna. Now, on the other side, we have the TV set itself, which can receive the signals and can recreate the video and audio information from the high frequency transmission signal. Let's go through the different components of the setup. This is the video signal generator which can generate almost any test pattern known to mankind. It is interesting in the sense that it not only has an output for a composite video, but also has three separate outputs, one for the luminance and two for the chrominance or color information. Now don't worry, what these signals comprise exactly will be discussed later in this video. In addition to these outputs, there are also three connectors for so-called component video signals. And these contain the separate information of the fundamental colors, red, green and blue, in the video signal. Now, the second piece of equipment we'll take a look at is this TV test transmitter, which can generate the high frequency signals required for the actual TV transmission. And this signal is a combination of both video and audio signals, and sometimes even more, like for example data. And we'll have a look at what these signals look like in practice. If you search on eBay, you might think I'm a very wealthy man, because you'll find that both the TV transmitter as well as the video signal generator are offered at sometimes outrageous prices, almost as if they're built of solid gold. And in fact, well, they are, at least partly. Fortunately, I did not have to win the lottery first to buy this equipment, because on the Dutch equivalent of eBay called Marktplatz, they were offered for just a few hundred euros together. Before we dive into composite video and transmission technology, let's first have a look at how an analog TV set displays the video information on a screen. Basically, it writes the images very rapidly, line by line, using a fast scanning beam of electrons. And this beam is generated in the back of the cathode ray tube, or CRT for short. Each of these lines takes approximately 64 microseconds to complete, and during this very short time, the intensity of the beam is varied according to the pattern. Now, as you can see, this screen shows a typical test pattern, and we'll take a closer look at one particular part of the screen. Here you see how the electron beam 
scans over the screen line by line in slow motion. And I did not use a high speed camera to record these images, but actually a standard IP camera with about 25 frames per second. So what I did here was make use of the fact that we display a static image, so the scanning process for each frame is identical, and it is repeated every 1 25th of a second, at least for the Pol TV standard that we have here. So I just set the camera to a short shutter time of approximately 20 microseconds, and then set the frame rate of the camera slightly off sync from the 25 hertz. Now, if the frequency is set exactly to 25 Hz, we observe the beam in the same position in every camera frame because the frame rate of the camera and the refresh frequency of the TV screen are exactly synchronized. But by changing it, for example, to 24.99 Hz, we sample at a different part of the writing process with each consecutive frame of the camera. I know this is cheating a bit, but the result is that you observe exactly the same thing as if you were recording with a high-speed camera at over 62,000 frames per second. In order to create these line scans on screen, we need a signal that controls the intensity of the beam during the writing process of each line. And this type of intensity information is encoded in a so-called video signal. Now for black and white TVs like this one, it is just basically a rapidly changing voltage that defines the luminance level for each point in the line, so basically the brightness. Now a monochrome TV just has one single type of phosphor on the screen, which emits white light. But of course the developers of monochrome TV wanted the images to be a realistic depiction of the displayed objects. So the luminance level is basically defined as the brightness level for the total of the red, green and blue colors in the original image as perceived by the human eye. And because the eye is not sensitive to every color equally, each fundamental color has a different contribution to the luminance signal. Because the eye is most sensitive to the color green, it has the highest contribution, followed by red and then blue. Now to illustrate this, here you see a color test screen next to the black and white equivalent. You see for example that the pure color red is converted to a darker gray than the pure green here just because our eyes are more sensitive to green than to red. So for black and white TV, which was the first thing around, the way that these video signals were constructed is actually pretty straightforward. The luminance level is just encoded as a voltage level in the video signal, and we can have a look at the luminance signal directly from this output of the video signal generator using an oscilloscope. And by the way, this small negative pulse at the beginning is a signal that indicates to the electronics the start of a new video line. And it is followed by a short interval of blank level, followed by an area containing the actual video signal. So basically the first part of the signal falls outside the active area of the screen, and the second part of the video signal is the part that is displayed on the screen. But what about color signals? Well, color is actually quite a different ball game. For color TV, you need additional information to recreate the three elementary colors, red, green and blue. And in the CRT of a color TV, there are three electron guns instead of just one, each for one of the three elementary colors. Basically, the front of the screen contains red, green and blue phosphor dots, and each electron gun can only excite the dots of one particular color due to its position. And also because of the presence of a shadow mask between the electron gun and the phosphor screen. Now, to recreate the original imagery in color, you need to know the values of the individual three colors instead of just a single luminance level. Now, the simplest solution for realizing color TV would have been to just record the elementary colors at the camera side and transmit these separately and recreate the image on the other side by just displaying the corresponding intensity values. Now one of the issues at the time that color TV technology was developed was that there were already millions of black and white televisions in the market. So the best chance for a smooth and successful introduction of color TV would present itself if the technology for color was somehow backward compatible with black and white. And this meant that the technology had to be based primarily on luminance and somehow sneakily incorporate color information. Of course, in such a way, that existing monochrome TVs would still correctly display the video. 
And this constraint in fact complicated things quite a bit. So the solution they came up with was both very clever as well as pretty complicated. They added a high frequency modulation signal on top of the original luminance signal. And this modulation actually contains the color information and is at a frequency slightly above the maximum that a black and white TV can resolve. So basically the black and white TV sees the average value of the modulated signal, which is equal to the luminance level. However, a color TV set has the electronics to detect this modulation and can then extract the color information from it. The color information is encoded in the phase and the amplitude of the modulation. And the way this encoding is done varies somewhat with TV standards. But in essence, they all determine color by comparing the phase of the modulation with respect to a reference having phase zero. Using this phase information and the amplitude of the modulation, the TV set can determine what kind of color the modulation represents using a color space. As you can see in this image, the color space that I'm using for this example is named YCBCR and that is because the video signal generator uses this particular color space. So what you see in this schematic is that the phase angle determines the type of color, also called the U, and the amplitude defines the color saturation. And there's actually a nice equivalent to this in the program Paint, which is installed on almost every PC. Now, if you open the color picker in Paint, you see this color diagram. And the x-axis represents the U, or the phase of the modulation. The y-axis is the color saturation, equivalent to the amplitude. And in this bar, we can choose the general luminance level. And these three things together define the color that is chosen. So by knowing the luminance value and the two chroma values, we know which color should be displayed on the screen. Now there's just one more thing. In order to determine the phase shifts, we need to know accurately what a phase of zero means. And this is defined before the start of each line by the addition of a short reference signal with phase zero. And it's called the color burst. The TV set locks an eternal oscillator to this signal and then remembers the phase for the duration of the full line scan. Just a short example. Here you see a color test signal with vertical bands and most of them are just gray levels. But there's one that has the color magenta, which actually consists of a combination of red and blue. Now here you see the signal of an individual video line as measured with an oscilloscope. And in the areas where the signal is just grayscales, the height of the signal is basically equal to the brightness of the grayscale. But two things are new. Here we see the reference oscillator signal, which defines zero phase. And here at the magenta strip, we observe that the signal is modulated. And the phase difference between the reference signal at the beginning and the signal of the colored band actually determines that this modulation represents the color magenta. Now from this figure, it is difficult to determine the phase, but fortunately we can also take a look at the signals of the chroma B and chroma R outputs of the signal generator. As you can see, they do output values in a sort of 0.6 to 1 ratio in this magenta band. And if we look up these values along the two axes of the YCBCR color space, we see that we indeed arrive at the color magenta. So that is in a nutshell how color is included in a composite video signal. However, there is still one step separating the luminance and chrominance information from the intensity values for the red, green and blue as displayed by the CRT. Now, to get the intensity values for each individual electron beam, we have to do an additional conversion, which involves a matrix calculation. So the luminance and chrominance values are multiplied by a matrix containing different intensity constants, which are themselves based on the constants from the color intensity perception. And only after doing this calculation, you arrive at the intensity values for the individual primary colors. Now for the example shown earlier, you see that to create the magenta peak, blue and red are strongly present and there is hardly any green in the signal. Now personally, I cannot begin to imagine how all of this was implemented using just simple analog electronic components. So I will not break my pretty little head over it, but 
What I find maybe more amazing is that they made most of this effort just to make Color TV backward compatible with monochrome TV. So much for video signals. Now, the problem is that a video signal is not something that can be transmitted through the airways. Also, we are missing one very important thing, and that is sound. So in the last part of this video, we'll look at how all this information is encapsulated somehow into an electromagnetic carrier signal that can be broadcasted. And we will do this by taking a closer look at the TV test transmitter. Let's first have a look at the user interface. This is the main menu and as you can see we can for example choose at which channel or frequency we would like to transmit. Now a channel is actually a small band of frequencies which is reserved for a particular TV station to transmit the video and audio signals in. And you can see that if I switch channels each channel is about 7 MHz wide. And this is much wider than used for example in FM radio, where each channel only takes up about 100 or 200 kHz. In fact, as I will show in a minute, the audio signal transmitted with the video only uses up a tiny fraction of the total bandwidth of a TV channel. In other parts of the transmitters menu, you can set for example the output power and the impedance. Now the next menu item is actually about choosing a particular transmission standard. So basically different countries have historically used different parameters or settings to modulate the signals. And this part of the menu allows you to choose a specific set of parameters used in a particular region. And if I choose a region, the machine can immediately set all the frequency information connected with that particular standard. The next menu item is actually about modulation and because all the settings have been loaded while choosing a transmission standard, we are basically all set to start broadcasting. Of course, we can change every individual setting, but instead we'll use uh, the standard setting and just make sure that the audio is set to mono for now. And if I switch on the RF signal and the modulation, the signal is transmitted through the air and can be picked up by the TV. But what does this signal look like exactly? Now, the best way to find out is by looking at the antenna output. However, in this case, using an oscilloscope to observe the signal is not very informative. We see that the output is roughly a sinusoidal signal, which is basically at the carrier frequency, but it's a bit messy because the carrier is heavily modulated. So a better way to look at the signals is to use a spectrum analyzer. Now, Spectrum Analyzer basically shows you how much power is transmitted within a particular range of frequencies. So it sort of summarizes the content of the signal as a spectrum of frequencies, which is a, a way clearer representation than looking directly at the wave emitted by the output. The Spectrum Analyzer that I use here is the SignalHound SA44B, which is a pretty affordable and versatile USB Spectrum Analyzer that is controlled from a PC. Here I have it connected to the output of the transmitter and to this laptop PC. Now on the screen you see the user interface of the Spectrum Analyzer. and There's actually a ton of options and it would not be very useful to go into all of this. But what I've done here is set the frequency range of the Spectrum Analyzer to the width of the transmission channel and the vertical range to the maximum output power of the transmitter. And as you can see at this point, both the RF signal and the modulation are still switched off. Now, if I switch on the unmodulated RF signal, you see this sharp peak appear at the transmission frequency. Now look what happens when I switch on the video modulation. Basically, the carrier frequency will start to move around within the frequency range of the channel very rapidly. And the video signal is contained in these very rapid variations of the carrier frequency. Now, unfortunately, these changes are so fast that we cannot follow them with the limited capabilities of this particular spectrum analyzer. What we can observe is the net average time spent by the carrier at each frequency. What you see is that if you change the video signal, the distribution of the frequencies in the transmitted spectrum also changes. For example, a zone plate test pattern almost fills up the complete available video bandwidth of the channel because it has a very, very high information content. 
So let's in addition switch on the audio carrier. And what we observe is the appearance of a new peak just outside the range of the video information. And if we zoom in at the frequency of the audio peak, which is still unmodulated by the way, then we can observe this single peak because it is just the carrier frequency without any audio information. Now watch what happens when I add a 100 Hz audio modulation to the carrier. You see that the peak widens because the 100 Hz audio is now modulating the frequency value of the carrier wave. And this is particularly clear when we look at a different representation called the waterfall representation. Here you see how the carrier frequency shifts in time due to the audio modulation. And when I set the modulation depth to a higher value, you see that the variations in the frequency also become larger and the audio signal becomes more intense. And in essence, the video signal is modulated in a similar way. Only the variations in the video signal are so fast and so spread out over a wide range of frequencies that we cannot observe this process in a similar way for video. Now the last thing I would like to discuss is something called the intermediate frequency. And in fact, before I made this video, I had no idea what it was. So I looked into it and found that it is the frequency used for processing the signals inside the DV receiver. Basically, it was invented to simplify the electronics. Now let me try to explain. If you have a modulated high frequency signal and you want to extract, for example, a video and audio signal from it, you need dedicated components and filters to achieve this. And the problem is that these components only work well at a very specific frequency. So if you have multiple TV channels that range from, let's say, 46 megahertz to 900 megahertz, you can never get them to work well for the whole frequency range. Basically, the demodulation electronics has to be fine-tuned for each transmission channel, and this would require very complex and expensive electronics. So instead, TV sets use a trick where the frequencies of all the different channels are first converted to the same intermediate frequency, and after this conversion, they can all be demodulated using exactly the same electronic circuit. To achieve this, a technique called heterodyning is used, and it works as follows. You take the incoming high frequency signal and mix it with the signal of a local oscillator. And this mixing actually involves the multiplication of the two signals. So the principle is based on a trigonometry rule that states that the product of two sinusoidal functions with different frequencies is equal to the sum of two cosine terms, one containing the difference between the two frequencies and one containing the sum of the two frequencies. So basically, the mixed signal contains a low and a high frequency component. Let's for a moment assume that this is the incoming carrier frequency and we multiply it with this signal generated by the local oscillator. Now the multiplication actually gives you this result and if you look carefully, you see that the signal indeed contains both a high and a low frequency component. Now here I have separately plotted these two signals. So what we can do in the physical world is, for example, take the mixed signal and filter out the high frequency component by using a low pass filter. And this leaves us with only the low frequency signal, which we can assign the name intermediate frequency. And in fact, by tuning the local oscillator to the right frequency and by using the low pass filter, we can convert every carrier frequency to the same intermediate frequency. Now in practice, the RF signal is of course modulated and since the frequency of the local oscillator is constant, the intermediate frequency signal will also be modulated in the same way as the RF signal, which is illustrated here. So the top graph shows you the modulated RF signal. This is the signal of the local oscillator. Here you see the raw mixed signal and here after filtering the modulated signal at the intermediate frequency containing the same modulation. So by now I hope I made clear how very advanced the technology was that you and I have probably been watching thoughtlessly for many years. And in fact, I have barely scratched the surface. For example, I have not discussed teletext or how Nikon data channels work or how stereo audio is implemented. In fact, when you dive deeply into this technology, it's a bit like falling down the rabbit hole. With that said, I think it's high time to stop. 
I will place a few links in the description in case you want to know more about specific aspects of analog TV. And if you have any comments or questions, please do not hesitate to ask them in the comment section. Hey. We zijn live. We zijn live. Ja. Fijne kerst.